Hi y'all, in this video I'm going to be responding to a video uploaded by Zonstar titled A Calm, Rational Discussion on the SJW Anti-SJW Wars. Uh, this came to my attention because I was watching Shinobi Yaka's channel, a uh, link to him below. He did a good response to this. And that's how I came, became aware that Zonstar uploaded it. Incidentally, Zonstar, I'm subscribed to you, but I didn't see it in my subscription box anywhere, so I don't know what that's all about. Maybe I just missed it. Anyway. Now, I read through the comments and I noticed that you were taking to task, Zonstar, you were taking to task uh, Shinobi Yaka for uh, calling out your um, sweeping generalization of the anti-SJW side and you were faulting him for not likewise calling out your supposed sweeping generalization for the SJW side. So we're going to spend a little bit, of little bit of time on that when we get to it. And another reason for that is that uh, I read an exchange you have with someone else about my gun videos and how I misrepresented your position, I'm in some sense being disingenuous. Uh, I have never knowingly misrepresented uh, your positions. Uh, when people make propositions, uh, there are logical consequences that go with it, and there are logical antecedents that go with it. And uh, even if a person doesn't explicitly say what the logical consequence is, if it is a logical consequence, it is part of the argument. I mean, typically we argue, in, not in pure syllogisms, we argue in enthymemes very often. We will omit one of the clauses or fail to draw the conclusion because the conclusion of the argument is so obvious that you don't need to draw it and no one will be confused by its absence. They will immediately draw that conclusion right on their own. So I don't want to misrepresent you. So uh, that said, just take it away, good sir. Greetings to you, Crocodile Army. I've been avoiding the topic of my stances on the various wars that rage between SJWs and anti-SJWs for a long time. It was one of the main factors, in fact, in my pulling back from YouTube for a while, the community obsession with all those issues. But maybe I can address my main stances in this one video so I can make myself clear, and then I can go back to other topics. He's going to be clear about what he means. Many anti-SJWs who obsess about this topic are super aggressive. And I'm going to stop you there, uh, because there are two ways that you could understand th that sentence. Uh, and if it were written out, it would be easier because you could see the punctuation to figure out what you're doing. It could be in a positive, uh, or it could be a further quantification of the group about which you're speaking. So you could be saying, uh, anti-SJWs, many of whom are obsessive, and then, you know, all the things that, that you say about them after that. Or you could say that there, uh, there is a subgroup of um, anti-SJWs. Many of that subgroup are uh, obsessive. So... And of that subgroup who are obsessive, many of those are aggressive. Now, many um, typically means a large proportion, a large number, or uh, very often the majority, more than 51% of a given group. I'm going to take you to be using the common uh, definition, that it is either a large proportion or something that is uh, larger than the, uh, it, it is a majority. And I don't take it, I'm not taking you to be saying that Within the total of the anti-SJW community, there are certain uh, subpopulations. One of, there is one particular subpopulation that is itself ob obsessive, and in that, many of those people are in turn aggressive, and uh, as you say, want to treat their fellow humans like shit and whatnot, uh, so I'll let you go on. They'll abuse and harass those they disagree with, and they'll encourage their followers to do the same, as so many keyboard warriors of all types will do. And I want no part of that, because I'm not in middle school anymore. Some hardline SJWs, on the other hand, are very quick to shut down conversation... Now notice here, when he talks about the SJW side in his calm, rational discussion, it's just some of them. Some typically means a few, so not all that uh, many. So when you talk about the anti-SJW side in your calm, rational discussion, you propose that uh, many of them are obsessive and aggressive and treat people very poorly, but the bad behavior on the SJW side is just some. Um, I don't think it's a rational position to remain ignorant of the lay of the land and then to wade into the conversation and try to explain things to people and state your position. I would suggest that a more rational way to go about this would be to look around uh, and notice the difference, uh, the, the actual lay of the land. This is one of the things I, I struggle when I talk to people who are on the left. I struggle with this because there is a lot of uh, word games um, that are played. The thing that you're missing here is what an SJW is. It's not just some SJWs who have the behavior you're describing. It's virtually all SJWs who have 
the, uh, the bad things you're going to describe. And the reason for that is that's why they are called the social justice warrior wing, because they behave in this way. It's those behaviors that are the, des are the reason they are designated as such. So if it's not all, it's virtually all of them. It's not simply some. And uh, you could call them SJWs, the you know, far left, regressive left, leftists, the feminist camp. It, it's that group of people who uh, exhibit these behaviors. So it's not simply some. It's virtually all of them. People or and if you're going to wade into the conversation, as I mentioned, it would behoove you to actually uh, appreciate what things are being used to designate what concepts, so that way you don't uh, come in here and try to paint a false, uh, paint a false narrative that on the one side it's a very large number, if not a, an absolute majority, it's just it's a whole bunch of them that behave this way, and, and on the other side, just a few, when the very uh, definitions that are at play here, the SJWs, or that set of leftists, or that set of people on the left who behave this way. Uh, please appreciate that. On crusade. Oh, by the way, suppose that there were going to be a rational and calm discussion on the rights of black people, and uh, the moderator comes out and, and described it uh, thus and so. On the one hand, you have simply, the, you know, in the Klan, you, you have a uh, hardliners on the propriety of having um, some kind of skew towards white people because they'll be more productive, uh, they will generate the wealth, and, you know, that will have knock-on effects for the whole of society, the benefits will accrue to everyone, and so that's why we should be geared towards that. And on the other hand, we have a bunch of uppity niggers. No one's going to take you seriously because you have already shown that you're not going to be objective, that you don't have the critical uh, thinking skills, incidentally. Uh, this is a, one of the word games I, I mentioned earlier, is, is uh, the, the leftists are able to encant the words, they're able to pronounce them. You say the words, but your hearts are empty, your ears close to the truth. But the uh, understanding of the meaning of the words is, is, is vacant, they just hide, what they do is they like to co-opt it. So critical thinking used to mean something, is objective analysis, a person's trying to check their, their biases, a person is trying to look at empirical facts. A person is trying to use logic to uh, either infer or, or deduce something like that, a, some conclusions from some objective data. But the SJW, the feminist, the leftist, the trans activist uh, side of the political spectrum, that little cabal of people over there, their way of, uh, you know, their, their little flowchart goes like this. Uh, is, has, has a proposition been proposed? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, does this proposition make you happy or sad? If yes, uh, uh, well then, um, it's true, congratulations, critical thinking achieved. And then if, it, if no, oh, well then it's false, congratulations, critical thinking achieved. You know, so it's, all roads lead to, you are a critical thinker. When all they've really done is looked in and, and thought, huh, or felt, hmm, does that, does that proposition give me a warm fuzzy or not? Mm -mm, that one pisses me off. It's clearly incorrect. It must be false. I'm glad I thought about it critically. ...against those who cross a line in the sand that they've made somewhere before they get all the facts, and I don't want to do that either. Some on each side may share traits I listed for the other as well. Buckle up for this part, though, anti-SJW snowflakes. In case you hadn't noticed, I'm your friendly neighborhood white guy. Hi, neighbor. I have an advanced degree, a very good career, and a fair amount of disposable income. None of See, I treat uh, people slightly differently based on how they represent themselves. Uh, you like to make mention of the fact that you have an advanced degree, uh, and therefore I'm going to treat you like you have a graduate degree. And I don't give you the same amount of leeway in a conversation I would give to a person uh, who is a high school student or a college student. Because um, you've had more education, I, I have a, an expectation that you will perform better than uh, you know, some recent high school graduate or some college student, because you've already been through all that. You've had a lot more time and experience in thinking things through to propose arguments. <clears throat> so when you make um, these types of er the types of errors I've already pointed out and some others I'll point out later on, I don't quite give you the same benefit of the doubt, which incidentally I shouldn't give you the benefit of the doubt, because the benefit of the doubt, as I've learned from feminists, is a privileged position. It's something that only a person who is privileged can engage in. And since I'm gay, clearly I'm disadvantaged, I'm oppressed all the time. Uh, 
And I, I just don't have the luxury of giving people the benefit of the doubt. Those things are anything that I need to feel sorry for, and nearly everyone on all sides agrees with that. No. Um, they don't want you to simply feel sorry for it. They don't want you to simply check your privilege. They want you to lose your legal rights. Now, this is what I was referring to earlier when I said you've waded into a conversation like completely ignorant of the lay of the land, which is inexcusable for a person who's holding himself as an academic, holding himself out to be an academic. You want to go around parading, uh, parading around your graduate degree, uh, you should step up and act like it and, and do your due diligence before you open your unlettered trap and start flapping it around and saying stupid shit. Uh, I'm going to give you an example now before someone says, it's an anecdote, an anecdote, it's not, there's no such thing as anecdata or something along those lines. This is one example, believe me, I have a lot more. I'm only going to choose one because I don't want this video to be many hours long. So the, uh, the progressive camp, you know, the SJWs, the feminists, the whatever, you know, that group of people that we're talking about, um, depend on useful idiots and people whose compassion exceeds their rational faculties in order to shove through their agenda. So there was a, a court case in the Supreme Court of the United States called Shewitt versus the Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action, which is a lawsuit uh, that was uh, started in response to the good people of the great state of Michigan uh, amending their constitution, ratifying an amendment to their state constitution that prohibits the government from discriminating either for or against people on the basis of race or sex. And uh, the Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action said, oh my god, no. Uh, we have, as, as uh, oppressed you know, people of color, we have a legal entitlement under the United States Constitution to displace the rights of white people. Now you may think I'm overstating their case. I'm not. Um, and it's worth noting that the, the Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action was the respondent in the United States Supreme Court. That means they won in the appeals court. Their argument that, uh, well, let me just give you the argument. So, uh, well, here. Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, we ask this court to uphold the Sixth Circuit decision to reaffirm the doctrine that's expressed in Hunter, Seattle, and to bring the 14th Amendment back to its original purpose and meaning, which is to protect minority rights against a white majority, which did not occur in this case. My goodness, I thought we've, we've held that the 14th Amendment uh, protects all races. I mean, that, that was the argument in the early years, that it protected only, only, only the blacks. I, but I thought we rejected that. You, you, you say now that uh, we, we have to proceed as though its purpose is not to protect whites, uh, not only to protect uh, minorities. I think it is a, it's a measure that's an anti-discrimination measure. Right. And it's a measure in which the question of discrimination is determined not just by, by, by power, by who has privilege in the society, and those minorities that are oppressed, be they religious or racial, need protection from a more privileged majority. And unless that exists, the 14th Amendment is not violated. Is that right? So if you have a banding together of various minority groups who discriminate against, uh, against whites, uh, that's okay? I think that... Do you have any case of ours that propounds that view of the 14th Amendment, that it protects only minorities? Any case? No case of yours. She is explicitly arguing that the United States Constitution, the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, uh, does not protect white people. It protects black people uh, from white people, a white majority. Um, now, this was an argument that was raised after it was adopted, and it has been rejected uh, time and time again uh, by the Supreme Court. That is not a reading of the statute. It clearly says, may not uh, life, liberty, property of any person, of any person may not den deny equal protection of the laws to any person. It doesn't say any person who, uh, except for white people. It says any person. So it's very clear in the Constitution and, and, that, and that amendment that uh, by its plain terms, the, the plain language on, on the page, 
that it protects any person. It protects everyone. So they want to argue that enacting a law at the state level that says, hey, that constitutional provision that, that says you shall not discriminate uh, on the basis of race or deny equal protection of the laws to any person within the jurisdiction is a great idea, and we should really just take that and give it its full measure here in our great state. They want to argue that that is unconstitutional. It is unconstitutional not to discriminate. This is the language game that they like to play. And they won in the appeals court. They lost in the Supreme Court. All those right-wing conservatives, I'm sorry, the religious right you like to whine on about, voted to uphold uh, the provision of law, that, the, the constitutional provision that says uh, you can't discriminate on the basis of race. Stop it. Exactly one liberal on the court voted for it. One. Kagan didn't participate. So that leaves, um, uh, it was Breyer who voted in favor of it, and so that left um, uh, Sotomayor and Ginsburg uh, agreeing with the proposition that the United States Constitution not only permits discrimination on the basis of race, but actually requires discrimination on the basis of race. Um, now, this is, is, this is curious because you talk about how, oh, it's just a few people here, a few people there, they're not very powerful. It isn't just a few people. It is a very large number of people, and they have considerable legal power. They are able to get uh, r racial supremacists and, and gender supremacist supremacists put on the Supreme Court of the United States to interpret the Constitution to say to mean exactly the opposite of what it very clearly says. So the position of one of the respondents in the case was, as I played it earlier, and it goes on, um, is that people of color should have and do have, by the United States Constitution, a legal entitlement that if they are tied for a position with a white person, the black person must win. You can't, you can't choose the white person. That would be, you know, no, 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 that's the privileged person. This notion of privilege comes up all over the place. And it's not enough that they want you to check your privilege, which is just secret code for shut the fuck up male or shut the fuck up white person, uh, shut the fuck up heterosexual, you can't talk, your opinions are invalid because of your penis or your race, you know, your race or, your, or whatever, uh, arbitrary whatever it is of the day. Your opinion does not count, unless you agree with us, in which case we'll go, oh, well, look at, look at all of our allies. Uh, they not only want you to keep your mouth shut, they want to dispossess you of your legal rights. They want to enact a regime that, uh, that permits the minority to strip the rights of the majority by reversing the laws, the, the meaning of the laws that are enacted by the majority to protect the minority from the majority. So these laws were enacted by the majority to protect the minority from the excesses of the majority, which now the minority is using to say legally entitles them to flip the script and oppress, uh, to strip the legal rights of the majority away from the majority. So everyone's familiar with the tyranny of the majority, uh, you're getting a very good look at what the tyranny of the minority looks like. It is, of course, true that in, in, in any just society, the majority will take a care to see to it that, major, uh, that minorities are not being uh, treated very badly, or aren't being treated unfairly or anything like that, which we've done in this country. Uh, it took a long time, but you know we have done it. We've codified it into law. Um, but also, you need to realize that the, that, that wants to make sure that the minorities have a fair shake does not go the next step further to empowering the minorities to strip away the rights of the majority, which is exactly what you are seeing time and time and time again in court cases all over the country, uh, in universities, for prestigious universities, formerly prestigious universities throughout the country, all over the place, attempts to usurp through legal power um, the right of people to peaceably assemble and to uh, have heretical thoughts. Lots of, lots of support to suppress that at universities. Apparently, uh, th these people who occupy the halls of power uh, are very small. Uh, they don't have a, much of a fan base, and they're, completely, you know, they're next to completely powerless or something to listen to Zonstar talk about how it's this tiny, tiny group of people. It isn't. And they are in the Congress of the United States. Uh, one just left the presidency of the United States. Uh, there are several of them on the Supreme Court. More of the the language games that the Supreme Court likes to play. Justice Breyer flirts with the idea that what the Second Amendment really means, what it was really codifying, is not the right for people to keep and bear arms, it was the right for people to know about firearms, 
Apparently this is from the provision of a well-educated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to know about the existence and use of firearms shall not be infringed. Now, in light of that, why isn't a ban on handguns while allowing the use of rifles and muskets a reasonable or a proportionate response on behalf of the District of Columbia? Because, Your Honor, uh, for the same reason that was offered by uh, numerous military officers at the highest levels uh, of the U.S. military at all branches of service, uh, writing in two briefs, uh, they, they agree with us that the handgun ban serves to weaken America's military preparedness because when people have handguns, handguns are uh, uh, military arms, they're not just civilian arms, uh, they are uh, better prepared and able uh, to use them and certainly when they join the, the military forces, they are issued handguns. And so if we assume the sort of military purpose to, uh, to the Second Amendment as an individual right, then the handgun ban, uh, as noted by our military amici, would uh, impede uh, I didn't that. read. I read the two military briefs as focusing on the nature of the right, which were, was quite a pretty good argument there, that the nature of the right is to maintain a citizen army. And to maintain that potential today, the closest we come is to say that there is a right for people to understand weapons, to know how to use them, to practice with them. And they can do that, you see, with their rifles. They can go to gun ranges, I guess, in neighboring states. It's just nonsense. Uh, he, along with Justice Ginsburg, think that the ca that capital punishment violates the Constitution. It's mentioned three times in the Constitution, approvingly. So apparently, the United States Constitution violates itself. This comes from the left wing, uh, the, the far you know the far left wing, the leftists, you know, whom we call the SJWs, the feminist camp, the you know, regressive left, that cabal of people. They have many people in high in positions of high power high offices of state who are trying to do these types of things. The, you know, the Dear Colleague letter from the Department of Education, uh, stripping due process rights for male students accused of sexual uh, harassment or sexual uh, assault or whatever. It is all over the place, and it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to look around and figure it out. You seem to uh, st you know, stumble through life in a complete stupor, completely oblivious to any of these actual things that are happening in the actual world the only a rather precarious position for a person who likes to bloviate about his graduate degree time I hear about Gil is when an anti-SJW tries to tell me that some radical SJW thinks I should feel guilty for my privilege because an article on a clickbait factory website that I could not possibly care less about says so. For a well, I can't speak for what other people do. But I make arguments about so about uh, actual legal policy, you know, laws that are being that are pending, laws that have been enacted, and judicial cases, among other social, among you know, uh, cultural factors. So uh, there's no shortage of people who talk about these actual legal consequences of, of these positions. I can only presume that you work exceedingly hard not to notice. It isn't simply that there is uh, some article written by some. Yahoo or other on some clickbait website or that you don't care about. These are people who roam the halls of power, decide legal policy, and decide uh, which laws the Constitution prohibits, which, one, which ones it permits, and which ones it requires. And I point out again, it made it through a United States Court of Appeals, I think even on an on bank hearing, that um, the United States Constitution, the 14th Amendment to it, requires the state to discriminate against white people in favor of black people. A lot of anti-SJW YouTubers, that's their bread and butter, cut and paste every week. Red meat for their fan base. Because it is in the news day after day after day. And it's not simply just, you know, oh, some people writing opinion articles. There are legislative proposals that incorporate this kind of stuff. There are executive decisions that try to push this stuff upon people. There are courts that are ruling that the Constitution requires discrimination. So it's, it's not simply uh, that it's read me. There are actual policies being enacted into law, like the Duluth model that uh, I think has been mentioned to you, where uh, they're, they're very careful not to say that the man should always be presumed to be the subject, uh, to be the assailant. 
uh, in the same way that they were very careful in the South when enacting the poll tax, not to say that black people only should have to pay the, uh, the poll tax. They, they, they're a little bit more clever than that. They just described all the things about the people who would be exempt that are uh, identical to being white in the same way that in the Duluth model, they just describe all the physical attributes of men uh, that women don't have. Oh, you, you should evaluate who's taller, who's larger, who's stronger, who's more capable of inflicting injury. You know, they might have well just said, you may as well, uh, now you can't do this on the basis of sex. No, no, no. But you have to ask yourself, officer, which of the two parties is capable of growing a beard? Which of the two parties has to register for the draft? And uh, that person should presumptively be the assailant, even if he's the victim. I'm sorry, if, the, if a person so described uh, is, is the victim. Uh, so... In a cynical attempt to get people to care less about their fellow humans. Right. Because caring about the rights of people who are being oppressed by government action is not caring about your fellow man. Obviously. If you think that white people should have rights equal to black people, you don't care about your fellow creature. Why are you such an asshole going around arguing that person A and person B should be judged on their merits, not the average characteristics of some group that they had no choice but to belong to? God, what kind of monster goes around, you know, only punishing the guilty and rewarding the people who work for it? You, No, 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 that's no way to, to run a just society that cares about people. That's oppression. Before you heartless shitlords. Before anti-SJWs get triggered and tell me there's no such thing as privilege, I agree that the people who coined the term in academia should have called it something else for clarity's sake. That's not responsive to the... Pro You're playing an onomasiological game here. We aren't worried about uh, this this uh, this uh, idea, this concept, what by what names can it be called? We're worried about the semasiological issue, namely that the word that is used denotes a particular uh, claim. It denotes a concept. What is the content of that concept? By whatever name it might otherwise be called. You could call it flippity floppity flu for all anyone cares. It still operates the same way. It isn't that we would be opposed to the word privilege if privilege was defined to mean, uh, you know, if, if privilege were a color, or a priv privilege were a species of bird, or a way of cooking food. Well, it's not, oh, it's just the word privilege you don't like. No, it's the concept that's denoted and connoted by the use. And so when you say that it should have been called something else, that is an onomasiological uh, shell game that you're playing. It's not responsive to the proposition. Privilege, as defined, the concept that exists attached to that definition, is what we object to, not to the particular word. Despite that, most people are plenty bright enough to understand it with 30 seconds effort, but won't because it's much more cool to ridicule people. I don't... That's uh, a bit rich that you're talking about how other people, if they really thought about it, they would understand the lay of the land after what you have been putting on display here. All right, uh, that's the bulk of what I want to discuss. Uh, there are some socialist policies he likes that he wants to talk about later on. I don't want to get into that. I just wanted to address this particular uh, portion of the video. So everyone else, ends on Star 2. Have a great day.